OK, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our latest webinar, which this uh, time is going to be talking about improving the visualisation of your snowflake usage and costs. Uh, on the call today, I have my colleague David Tomlins, who's our head of service delivery, uh, Ryan Peachy, who's one of our click consultants, and myself, Neil Thorne, I'm uh, head of origination at Ametis. And just to go through the agenda of what we're going to cover today, I'm going to do some brief introductions. Then David is going to take over and we'll talk about the approach that we had to this, um, the, the app that we're going to show you and the issues and considerations that we uh, came up with as we were going along. We'll talk about the architecture behind it. Um, and then uh, Ryan will take over and we'll do a demonstration. And uh, we will also talk about the roadmap that we've got for these apps as well. So just to uh, set the scene a little bit, uh, Click asked us to get involved with this project to uh, create apps that will uh, make use of the Click's associative engine to get more information out of Snowflake usage and costs because it's a pay as you go. A piece of software, those costs can escalate quite quickly if uh, if they're not kept an eye on. And so uh, hopefully we'll show you how we can maintain better control. For, we've got one or two on the call who um, aren't, maybe aren't aware of Ametis. So we are uh, largest dedicated click consultancy in the UK. Uh, we were number one partner last year, which is a, a big up for all my uh, colleagues, some of whom are on the call. Um, we are an elite channel partner and we cover the whole platform from um, data integration all the way through to advanced analytics and uh, predictive. It's just over 25 of us and uh, we provide full range of added value services on top of the software itself. So you can see their consultancy development. We have uh, a UK dedicated support desk where you can actually ring people up and talk about your issues rather than doing it via email. Uh, we also have a dedicated uh, education and learning centre, um, which um, you, know, you are all more than welcome to look at the courses that we've got available. There are more details on our website. So I show this slide each time, so apologies if I'm beginning to bore a few of our regulars, but um, I'm just, all I'm showing here is the breadth of the whole of the click platform. So what we're going to talk about today in terms of the, the application that we've written probably covers elements of data integration, but also primarily on the analytics side. But I think I'll, I'll leave the details to uh, David, who can talk about that uh, a little, little bit more detail than I can. Um, and so I will hand over to David, who will first go through the approach that we took. So, David, over to you. Thanks, Neil. Um, yeah, so Click engaged us um, and paid us to build a template app um, with the idea it would be given to their customers free of charge with the sort of underlying aim to give it to their QCDI customers who don't really have any ClickSense analytics. So it was to give them a sort of taste of their capability. Um, we had kind of four main areas that we sort of had to cover. Uh, provide value above what is available as standard Snowflake, which is probably a given. So what we did is we analysed Snowflake and a lot of other products on the market. Um, uh, while we were looking at it, Snowflake was actually enhancing its own capability. However, it's still fairly basic. So we we, we did look at that and other products on the market. And then um, those other products, however, would tend to enforce you to provision your own architecture, whether that's servers. Um, but from what we could see in terms of capability, it all sort of mainly focused on cost. Um, Obviously, that is key, um, as Neil sort of mentioned earlier, um, but we felt we could provide a better scope, all round scope to cover a lot more areas. Uh, one of the key things was to show off ClickSense capability. So we could not have done this in another BI tool <laughs> um, uh, without having done a lot of engineering in Snowflake first to get some of the output that we've built as part of the Click script. Um, however, doing it sort of a two part project with 
Snowflake engineering and ClickSense dashboarding would make this much more complicated to deploy. Um, also, the associative engine uh, is key here. So um, we do have one main events table. Um, however, there is multiple fact tables. So other products on the market would sort of struggle in, in those areas. Um, and also while we were we were building this, the sort of new visualization elements came out. So um, the layout container was sort of released, which is great. Um, so we wanted to show that off, but just as a word of warning for those people who've not really used it yet, it can mean that your dashboards take two or three times longer to build just because of the amount of granularity of what you can sort of, the accuracy of what you can show and line up within an app. Uh, the other thing we had to look at is just to make it really simple for users to set up and use if it was going to be distributed uh, globally, we it couldn't have a long list of instructions to um, to set it all up. Um, it, it needs to be as simple as possible, otherwise um, you kind of lose engagement as soon as it gets too complicated or people are not able to do it. So as far as to set it up, you need to run a script in Snowflake, which will sort of come with the app. It's probably a 10 line script. Um, that's because at the moment account admin is the only person who has access to the sort of data that we require. So they need to run a script. And what that script will do will uh, create, basically create a service account and a role and a warehouse specifically for um, this monitoring app. But it, it's a, it's a, it's a case of copying and pasting that script into Snowflake and running it and it all sets it up for you. Um, and then you just need to create a connection against that service account that we've built. So it's probably a five minute job to set it up externally of the app. And we were also challenged by Click to um, answer five key business questions, um, which I'll sort of go on to. Um, so obviously, as everyone's very quite aware, Snowflake can be very expensive, uh, particularly if you don't manage it very well. Um, so for the very first one is always going to be cost. So things like what's my current cost? What's my cost or growth compared to the contract? Like if you're going to worry, you're going to go over the contract that you set up with Click, uh, sorry, Snowflake. Uh, and what sort of things are costing me the most? What sort of things can I make more efficient to reduce my costs? So we focus on those areas. Um, usage. So which users, warehouses and databases are being used the most? Uh, and when does that usage occur? Um, just to make sure, because sometimes you can have a lot of usage, but it not cost you very much. And sometimes you can have one big process which costs you a lot. So it's key in managing your sort of environment to understand the difference. Um, how many, yeah, so inventory, so how many databases, schemas and columns have we got? How is that growing over time? If you're going to manage size, I mean, the storage on Snowflake is fairly, relatively low compared to compute, but it's it's good to see how that um, sort of infrastructure is going to grow over time in terms of um, creation of new databases. Um, security, so what roles are there and who's got each role? How many logins there are? How many failed logins there are? Um, who has access to what piece of data. So that was one of our key bits for security. I think at the moment, if you look at Snowflake and the, the data that's available in those usage schemas, it's very hard to see who has access to what data. And that was one key point that we wanted to be able to make is that if I select this table or database, I think it's da database, that has sensitive data in it, who has access to that data? It, it, immediately gives you sort of data governance questions that um, everyone's keen to understand. Um, the next element's performance. So how's my data performing? So what's the distribution of query runtime? Are there things that are taking a particularly long time? Uh, how much time does it take for a warehouse to suspend? So we noticed on our um, tenant straight away that 40 to 50 percent of our costs was warehouses waiting to suspend so as soon as we saw that in the app we kind of reduced all those times down and it, it sort of reduced our bill which wasn't a huge amount anyway but it reduced our bill from what it was to significantly lower um, as well as performance elements such as which caches uh, which queries are using cache so they're going to be performing quicker therefore costing you less money and which queries are spilling memory which means you've got an under sized warehouse 
um, and it's storing uh, memory either to disk somewhere to be able to process the data that's coming in, which is going to mean that the date, um, the process is going to take a lot longer and cost you a lot money, more money. So it allows you to kind of structure your Snowflake environment a lot better if you understand these key metrics. Um, these are the sort of issues and considerations that we had to pay attention to when we were building this. Um, cost to customer to run the process. So extracting the data, pulling it into ClickSense is going to use up um, compute credits, whichever way you look at it. So when we were building this, we we're very sort of cognizant of that. Um, so where possible, we were using uh, Click Resource to do the transformations because that's effectively bundled in as part of your platform costs. Um, but it was something we were definitely aware of. Um, size of Snowflake tenant. So this app can go to many different customers, uh, everyone with a different size of Snowflake tenant. Uh, ours is pretty small. Uh, ours has got some business process, but it's mostly um, uh, demo data, which gets used um, sporadically. Um, so the way that we originally built this was uh, sort of full reloads because that took a matter of minutes on our system. But as soon as we started testing this with clicks data and some of our other larger customers that have Snowflake, um, it was clear that we needed to take that into account. So, for example, um, one of one of the people we tested on had over a million queries a day. Um, so that's not including warehouse events, uh, logins and all that other data as well. So it, it, we had to be very sort of aware of the different types of um, tenants that this would be run against. Um, Snowflake Edition, so you do get different capability depending on what Snowflake Edition you have. We've built this for standard, so it should work for everyone. Um, we do we are thinking about some of the more enterprise functionality and in, in future releases, um, but this should work against any sort of standard uh, Snowflake edition. Um, and uh, lastly, but not least, um, when Snowflake provides you costs within the usage um, databases, those costs are by warehouse by hour. So um, it doesn't give you costs down to a user database application type level. Um, so what we had to do to be able to give you that insight, while it might not be 100% ac uh, accurate because it's impossible to be 100% accurate, um, we what we've done is apportioned the costs uh, down to those levels. So while it yeah, so it will give you an indicative cost. Um, down to that granularity, even though um, it's it's not what's provided by Snowflake. So you can see that this this application is costing me so much money, um, or there or thereabouts. Um, so that's that, that's kind of the um, the introduction to the project and what we were thinking about when we built it. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Ryan to sort of talk about the architecture uh and uh demonstrate the application lovely job thank you david um yeah so i'm going to talk through the architecture and some of the design choices that sort of stem from um what david alluded to on the previous slide around some of the decisions we had to make so um all of the extraction and transformation is done within the click script to utilize click all of Click's potential. Um, and there are some things that we could straight load, for, like things like your list of databases, your schemas, your tables, your columns, etc. cetera. Um, but there are other much larger data sets like the query history, your warehouse events, and some more laborious um, transformation stages as well, um, which required um, more efficient ways of loading data for those much larger tenants. So we had to um, we had to make the design choice to actually store out some data to QVDs to be looped through daily um, and only fetch the amount of data that we think is appropriate for a tenant. So if you are a much smaller tenant, it will fetch up to 30 days or even a full data set, depending on the complete size of your tenant. But for the much larger 1 million queries a, a day type tenants, which are much, much larger, that will then only fetch up to, I think it's about seven days or 14 days, depending on roughly how much we how much size we think the data is going to be. Um, and what we do is we load them efficiently into some QVDs where, where 
where that made sense. Um, we then had a transformation layer that sort of helped bundle and helped build a more harmonious model that allowed us to answer some of these business questions. So filtering to a user to see what access they have, as David said, is quite hard within um, clicks uh, in Snowflake's current account usage schema where this is all fetched from. Um, so a lot of the hard work is done within the clicks um, click script to sort of build that data model, which I'll come on to very shortly. Um, there's other things that are um, transformed as well. So we we build, um, we um, we look at the grants and we look at inheritance as well. So this was a big part to make sure that we don't miss out role inheritance because of the way Snowflakes um, our back security works. And we also had a daily cost aggregate as well um, amongst the core events table, which I'll show you in a second. Um, and all of this, again, all of this processing is done within Click and um, and the setup, as David alluded to, is, is like say 10 lines of code on, on your Snowflake environment and a connector and you can be well away, um, which was sort of why we've kept it and that that made it very simple to deploy as part of our architecture choice um, if we could get the next slide please neil so that just wanted to sort of talk through at a high level the data model um, i've sort of grouped it into four key areas um, the first area or the box with one in it on the left hand side that is sort of our inventory area so this is where we bring in the details and we link them up and build a bridging table to make sure that we can cohesively link over into sort of the right hand side of the data model and the center of the data model to, to build that cohesive link um, the right hand side is our cost join so this gives us um, the logic and the tables and the, how we've apportioned the costs out to our warehouse sessions. Um, so we allocate a warehouse session to to a query and we can see who's using that um, as well. Um, and that, that sort of leads into our events table, which is right in the core of the data model, the transaction table as it's laid, labeled up, um, where we can list all of the transactions, all of the events that are happening in Snowflake to be able to give details um, whether that be your queries, whether that be the events of grants, um, your login events or, or various elements that help answer the business questions that we were set out to achieve. Um, we've, we've, we've structured in this core model to be able to build a cohesive flow from cost to who's using what to what the inventory is, something that would would be quite complex on Snowflake itself. Uh, and the fourth box is just the additional measures and metrics and details that we bring in against users roles and, and the session. So you can get a more fuller detail around that. So that sort of gives you a very quick high level overview into the data model and some of the architecture choices that we made. Um, I think that does now lead me on to the demo, um, which I will have to nick the screen. So if you just bear with me one second. Share. Come on. Find the buttons. Share this one. All right, there we go. Has that screen come through? Yeah, yes, it does. Got some yeah. nods on the screen. That's good. Cool. Right. So this is the app. You, if you saw the blog, you would have seen um, a few snips of this. So we're going to sort of show you it interactively. So this is the overview page um, of the app. So this is what you're greeted with. Um, it gives you a rundown of the five key areas, so cost, usage, inventory, security, and performance, and sort of the headline KPIs with a couple of supporting KPIs where it made sense. Um, to support those. So what we can see here is we've got some dummy data in here as well. Um, and we can see our Q4 costs here as an example was was upwards of 92,000. So it gives you an idea of the cost on your tenant at a glance. Um, and you can also look at what your current quarters cost is or cost to date is as well. And this can change depending on what the filters you have selected in the costing page, which I'll come to shortly. Um, we've got our usage as well. So we can look at how many users, how many active users you have in the last 30 days, um, as well as the number of users uh, across your whole tenant, as well as the number of warehouses as well, just as a high level overview. Um, you've got your inventory, which gives you uh, account of your databases uh, and you can see so, uh, for all of the key KPIs there is a support, supporting chart in the background which uses the new layout container um, to overlay sort of behind that or the KPI in front of it whichever way you want to look at it um, and we can sort of see the inherent growth as well so it can give you some context um, just sort of at a quick glance um, and it also gives you account of your schemes and tables. Um, with security you can look at how many roles you have um, as well as sort of um, we've 
got how many logins, successful logins, and how many failed logins you've had over the sort of the, the period of 30 days in this instance. And then we've got some of our key performance measures, which we'll dive into shortly as well, which with, with the cache utilization, how much memory has spilled, and how many queries have failed. Um, and then there's some contractual information as well. Uh, which will give you information about your contract, when it starts, when it ends, the value of that contract, as well as how much have you spent of your contract and how far through are you on that contract. So you can sort of see, are you spending more or less than sort of where you are throughout your contract to sort of help budget your spend and sort of see, do I need to increase my budget? Do I need to increase my value or do I need to decrease um, or, or do I need to, you know, have I got more room there to operate um, as well? Um, so that's sort of the overview, and I'm going to move into the costing page um, to start with. This is where it will sit here and load for a, a minute. It's been popping up very quickly all day. Let's give it a refresh. Um, and the, so I'll move into the costing page. And here we go. So on the costing page, what we've done is we've got a some clear buttons across the top to look at whether you want to compare your monthly costs, your quarterly costs, or your year costs. And you can also flick between your uh, the dollar amount or the compute credits that is sort of Snowflake's currency for compute. Um, and you can sort of have a sort of a comparison of a month on month and a previous month to last month to sort of give you an idea of your cost and growth or shrinkage, or are you using more, are you using less? And what does that look like and how does that feel? And obviously the more you sort of look at this, the more you come back to this, the more you sort of get a feel for your, you know, the numbers and growth as you go along as well. So here we can see as an example, um, we've got February, which was last month, we spent that much. Um, and we can see um, for this month to date, we can see we're, we're on track to this um, as well. And we can also look at the last month to date, so the previous periods um, as well, so the previous year, you can see where was I this time last year and what was the growth year on year as well for that period. Um, and you can flick this to quarter as well and even year as well, and you can go on. And if you've not got a previous year on year, so it will just show us nothing, um, evidently, depending on how long you've had your tenant active. Um, towards the bottom, I'm going to bring your attention to a couple of the charts. We've sort of got a cumulative cost. So this will show you um, where, where am I? So depending on what filter and what period you have selected, um, where am I within what day of the month and how did I spend this compared to the the, the last full month as well? So I can look at my my month to month. What am I trending as? Am I spending as much as I was this time last month? Is that growing? Is that shrinking to give you more of a comprehensive idea on, of your tenants growth as well? Um, we can look at your contract as well. So one of the key things we wanted to look was contracted spend. So we average out your sort of the day rate almost of your contract and value left on that to give you um, where am I spending uh, up to that line, right? If I'm spending over that, I'm going to run out of money. If I'm spending under that, I'm going to be saving, you know, saving money, but I, I'm not spending as much as my contract allows me to essentially by day. But you may, you know, you have to forecast your growth as you go through, uh, which leads me to cost forecast. Now, our graph doesn't sort of forecast a lot there, but it, but it will forecast. If you've got a growing rate, it will sort of give you the next few months worth of growing rates to sort of see well, where am I looking to end up if I keep on this spend tra trajectory that I'm currently on. Um, and we've also got um, this value growth analysis chart, which I think is a really great chart. Um, there's a drop down to select what sort of measures you want. And this sort of gives you a bit more depth into high spenders, you know, who's spending, what is spending the most money, who's growing, who's shrinking. So if I look at users as an example, I can see here um, I've got my cost for the last full month across the bottom and I've got my sort of my growth metric on the left hand side. So I can see I've got my quadrants and I can look at the top right quadrant. I can see I've been the heavy spender and I'm going to be and, I'm, and I keep spending more. So I can see that I'm spending a lot more in there. Um, but we've also got people and processes and um, sort of service accounts that are on the sort of not growing or um, have a low cost as well and you can sort of get a perspective and you can view that through your users you can look at your database cost you can look at the roles as well you can see which roles are growing in cost um, so you can sort of see you know you come back to this one day and you know that one role that you've been keeping an eye on or just created you can see a spike you can kind of expect it but it sort of gives you a a clearer perspective and a bit more of a visualization on who is spending what and it 
and start to spot some of those outliers that you can then start to control. Um, we've then got the cost details, which you can really draw, drill down into sort of the queries and some more of the cost apportionment as well to see as a share, as a rate, who's got the most queries, what is the cost spend across those as well, and how is that apportioned by a percentage points. Uh, and again, all of these you can flick through um, into the compute credits. So I'm going to move on to usage um, to sort of start looking at obviously the usage, what drives these costs as well, which is ultimately running uh, queries and processes on Snowflake, right? So the users start to give us a picture of your warehouses, what those top workloads are, um, what size they are, as well as sort of, you know, what is the share of query count? As David alluded to um, in some of the, in his piece earlier, you could have warehouses that are um, doing lots of queries, but they may be very small, quick, snappy processes or quick, snappy uh, queries. But you could have a um, a much larger warehouse that doesn't do many queries, but doing much bulkier, heavier queries as well. And you can sort of start to see and picture that out. We also give you a view of your users as well, so you can sort of see who's logged in, how many users have been created, and start to get a feel for growth of users uh, as well as sort of who's using what. Um, you can then see your applications. So we look at the sessions of what um, what the queries have been, um, where the queries have come from, and we can start to build a view of those sessions um, and sort of see where they're coming from. So you've got things like Talend, Infinity, um, Snowflake itself uh, from the web app and in the UI that you're querying, and there's others that you can dive into as well. Um, and where this starts to get very powerful is you can look at your distribution. So you can filter to a warehouse. Um, I've just clicked on the, the pie chart there. And you can start to look at when is that warehouse operating, when are the queries running on there. And you can start to build a picture of, ah, I've got two warehouses operating in the middle of the night. Actually, I could consolidate those processes and, and probably load up my warehouses a bit more um, to sort of start consolidating some of those costs instead of running two warehouses in parallel. Um, you could move them onto one. And this view starts to help build some of that picture. Um, as you can see, if I select them all, you can clearly see, you know, business as usual in the middle of the day. There's queries, there's things going on. And then you can start to see, um, you know, towards the middle of the night when no one's working, um, you know, there's a probably a pro. You could clearly see batches of processes that could be happening here at one to two in the morning as well. So you can start to highlight when your warehouses are really running. Um, and you could look at the credit distribution as well. As so you can see, where are you spending most? Um, is it business as usual? Um, is it middle of the night in overnight processes, et cetera, to give you an idea of where your spend is happening or when your spend is happening on what day of the week as well. Um, we also then start to sort of give you a trend of, well, people use this. So how, what is your user growth and what does that look like over the next few months um, to sort of give you an idea on, you know, if, is that going to grow? Does that look like to be continuing to grow as well? Um, and then there's a deep dive into the usage detail. And I really like this view, actually. So you could look at a user. So I'm going to search for myself um, and then you can sort of see who is accessing Snowflake from where, so which applications and what sort of workloads are they doing? So you can see I use the web app and I also use it through the VS Code extension as well. Um, and you can see the workloads that I'm performing on there and sort of the share of workloads. And as you noticed, I filtered to myself and it also shows me what I have access to and what where my usage is coming from as well. So as an individual, if you've got new people or you've got existing people or you've got, um, you know, you might have teams in silos and you want to see where, what they're doing and what they're operating, you can filter to those users as well and you can see the usage in the warehouse, which is where that continuous data model really comes in. Um, so I'm going to move on to inventory. Uh, I think it gives you a good overview of the usage page. So inventory, again, it goes back to how many databases you have, your schemas, your tables, and what your data composition looks like across those as well. So you can see there's some supporting metrics. Size is a nice one. So storage does cost in Snowflake. Um, you could be storing absolute terabytes and terabytes of data, um, or you could be storing you know, smaller values of data as well. Because it's pay as you go, you can store as much as little as you need or require um, and you can look at you know what is your growth on databases as well so how many is new in the last three months um, and we can look at unused as well which is a key metric because you might have terabytes worth of data just sitting there doing nothing and then you can start asking the questions of do i need them do i 
you know, can I get rid of them? Um, and there's an analytics tab here called unused databases. You can just see a list of the unused databases and how long they've not been useful. Um, and obviously, because they have, don't have much data, these cost us very minimal. Um, but if you had terabytes and terabytes stored in here, you could start to see you've you're just got monthly costs of storage for data that you're not processing or utilizing. So you can start to unweave some of that and start to build some of that picture. Um, as well, um, across here, you can start to utilize the some of the, and answer some of the questions. What we set out to was who has access to what, which is a really big question and a really good point. Uh, uh, really, really quite tricky element to get out of Snowflake directly. Um, because we've modeled this in such a way, I can select an individual. I'll select myself again. And you'll see if I select that, you'll see the inventory tree map changed here. So this shows me sort of the databases I have access to and the views all changed above. And this shows me what I have access to. So again, you could do this the other way. I could select the database here um, and I could select, uh, we'll take the demo race data one. And I can see here that this is one database. I can see information about that as well, but I can also see the user list as well um, within the filter or actually go over to the security view and you can see a more, um, you can see this in another view, but you can see that some people do and don't have access to this. So you can start to then drill down onto those data sets that have PII information or more sensitive information and really do an audit check on who has access to what as well. Um, and there's other filters here as well. So you can also look at applications. So I could look at the VS code entries that I'm looking at um, and I can look at, um, maybe I can't, I thought I could. Um, I could go on to um, roles as an example, and I could you know, filter to a role and I could look at what access that role has um, as well um, to give me, uh, again, this one doesn't have access to anything um, as well. And that gives me an idea and a rundown of inventory. Um, into security again, um, this gives us an idea of my roles. Um, roles with zero users, so do you have redundant roles? Um, and I can also look at, are my grants appropriate to roles? Um, so I can see, is this is this just a usage role? Does this just does this role just have monitoring privileges? And you can see the privileges down here and you can filter to these as well. Um, we can look at login history as well. So you can see how people are accessing, how successful they are at putting their passwords in or using single sign-on um, as well. And you can filter that again to use. I'm going to always use myself. Um, and you can see here, I had a few failed attempts. I probably reset my password, but you can see how often people are um, logging in um, and you can sort of see when those bots and service accounts or are people operating out of hours. Um, you can look at those logins as well and you can sort of see how are they accessing so this is to auth um, or password punched in via the ui as well um what i what i will point out on this page is the privilege details analytics tab here at the bottom this is really powerful so as i mentioned the way we architected this is we looked at um we made sure that we looked at inheritance so if i've got a role access to a role as inherits something from another role. Um, it's quite hard without building sort of the, the hierarchy um, to, to get that information out of Snowflake. So we've pre-done that, we've done all the crunching the numbers um, and I can select a user and I can see all of those individual privileges as you can see that it changes and it will show me everything that that individual has access to, what types of privileges there are. Um, I can also now see what roles they have access to as well. I can see that these will be um, roles that they have direct access to and inherited as well um, and that's what sort of gives you an idea of how I've granted someone a role but actually they've now inherited something I shouldn't really have given them. This view allows you to dive into that information and really see that based on your business knowledge. Um, and I'll dive into the last page, um, which is our performance. So this is where you can start to um, get an idea of where you can make some really quick wins, where you can find some education opportunities. Um, so this gives you a view of your um, query history over the last 30 days in this instance, maybe less if your um, tenant size is, is bigger. Um, and that goes for all of the views we've been through so far. Um, I can unfilter me. We can, see, so we can look at the queries all time. We can see how many incidents we've had, how many queries have failed. And we can look at sort of how long they're running for and which ones failed within which types of buckets as well. So we've got short, quite short running queries here. Um, but we can also look at the memory spillage. So we don't really run in this example, massive queries here. So there's no sort of spillage or we, we are using the right size warehouses for the jobs. 
um, at hand and we're not processing those very large amounts of data in this instance. So our memory spillage is, is zero. So we've optimized and we've made sure that we, we've drummed that down. Um, we can also look at our warehouse so we can see hours waiting for warehouse to suspend. So by default, when you spin up a new warehouse, if you don't set the properties, the warehouse will idle and shut down after 10 minutes. But you can spot that. You can actually say, well, do I really want it to shut down after 10 minutes or do I want it to shut down straight away? And you can see the databases that are uh, the warehouses, sorry, that are that are um, you know not shutting down as soon as you're finished with them, and you can optimize on that and save some cost there as well. Um, we can look at the cache. So obviously, queries fetching the cache are much more efficient, can be more effective. Um, so we can look at the the query cache as well and sort of see the rate over time. Um, on that. Um, on the bottom here, we've got a 30 day, uh, in this instance, query summary, maybe less, um, depending on the your tenant size. And you could sort of see the query IDs, where it was done, the query time, how many um, seconds it was running for, what application it was. You could start to drill down a bit more into it. Um, there's also a really handy Snowflake URL. So this will take you to your tenant um, if you click on it and it will take you to the query history where you can look at the uh, the, the the sort of the breakdown of how that query performs um, and what the steps was of that query to you know to further deep dive into it as, as you sort of require and then you can filter down there's a couple of flags at the end here to look at your long running queries which ones are using cash or not and the query spilled as well um, we have a warehouse summary as well so this just gives you those metrics across the warehouses so you can sort of see you know, have, have I got a warehouse that's always using the cache or not? Is there a warehouse always spilling to the storage, um, either local or remote storage? And then you can start to find those and optimize those or move those queries or processes onto a more suitable warehouse that you may already have and and, and sort of start aligning your um, your processes. Um, again, the filters on the left hand side. So I could look at myself here as well and I could see, you know, this is how many queries I'm doing. This is how much I'm using the cache. This is how much I'm spilling over. Here's the warehouses I'm using and the details, you know, the query rates, the success rate, et cetera, on those. Um, you know, I could look at the applications um, as well. So I could fill it to talent, uh, might not be much. So all of the stuff that we have in talent as part of our demos, we can see the cache that that uses, what warehouse that's using, how many queries, how many have failed. So you can start to dive into, um, you know, you might have a role set up for a very specific process or an application and you want to monitor that or you want to look at that. You can start to dive into that and start making those more efficient, look at those processes uh, back and throw. Um, so that that sort of is an overview sort of within the time that we have got. Um, so, yeah, that sort of gives you a rundown of sort of the key elements across um, across all of all of the sort of the main uh, five key areas to try and answer those business questions um, that we were set out to achieve. Um, so I think if David, um, not David, if um, Neil, you could pop the slides back up. I think I've got a couple of yeah. slides just mm -hmm. to sort of round off. There you go. Yeah, can I have the next one, please? Oh, wrong way. There we are. So yeah, as so, some of you may notice that there are some things we don't have in here currently, um, but they're definitely on the roadmap, and they're definitely things that you know are in scope for future versions, right? So there's things like your pipelines, snow pipes, your tasks, file ingestions using copy into is a very big part and can cost a lot. Um, streams as well, so streams on your tables. Um, there's some other performance measures that we're looking to add, so things like table churn, as well as sort of your query queuing on your warehouses um, to sort of see have you got where house is absolutely stacked and the queries are just sitting there waiting for some resource to become available um so you need to either you know you need to size up or you need do you need to size out those can start helping those questions um expanding on the inventory so looking at your stages your sequences integrations file formats procedures and functions all of the core inventory that you have on snowflake making it you know building it into this to see who has access not just to what tables um, you know, tables, databases, and schemas, but what stage of sequences, integrations, file formats, procedures can those people run as well to really build more into it? And then expanding into sort of um, the enterprise only um, type measures that you can get out of um, Snowflake as well. Things to do with tagging, your policies around um, row level and column level masking and, and obfuscation. I can't hardly say it. Um, Easy for you to say. Yeah, <laughs> um, individual table access details as well. So looking at the details, um, you can get a much more granular detail of who is accessing what table. 
um, and how often at the enterprise level. Um, and you could sort of uh, um, add in performance measures around search optimizations for single, you know, looking through big, uh, large data sets to find singular keys, looking at the end, um, spotting opportunities there, and then sort of more into the fail, failover and replication type processes you get with um, the enterprise version and beyond into business critical that um, can be very key um, to, to know. So they are all on the roadmap. They're all things coming so um you know but the, but the dashboard currently does give you a very good baseline and, and can answer some of those you know heavy hitting questions quite quickly as well um so we can move on please neil we um, we, we, ha we have had a question actually uh, oh yeah and i don't know whether whether it's uh, the right time now but um so gordon has asked can this app be set up to trigger an email alert if the costs are going crazy and immediate action needs to be taken say someone has a long running query uh, on a large warehouse, you know, on a very large warehouse, how often do you need to load up the app? So depending on the size of your tenant is it, probably a, it's probably the way I'll start with this answer. If you've got a smaller tenant, um, you know, the reload times are generally going to be sh quite shorter. If you've got a much larger tenant, there's a lot of processing that goes on. So that could take, you know, for an initial run, that could be up to an hour or more to really get that, um, data in here and process because it's just the sheer size of it so if you have a large tenant and you're trying to spot those things this won't really give you an active live view of what's happening it's more of a as and when you reload this so you may reload this daily and you may look back on what's happened and see what's happened yesterday um, for more things like that there is the snowflake resource monitors that you can just have a hard cap on your credits per day to stop things like that happening to stop to really force and stop the warehouses and suspend them directly in snowflake this is more about monitoring what happens um, and being able to prevent that going forwards and spot the opportunity you could you know if you've got a smaller tenant and you want to track spend you could reload this and then build a reporting suite off the back of it with clicks reporting functionality and email that stuff out if required um, but it's not really for a live monitoring as it happens now just for the sheer size on a large tenant that becomes very tricky but just sheerly because of the reload time yeah right uh next slide yeah so this is john, john made you jump on this or, or david are you gonna yeah I, d I don't mind i can say um yeah so um we are also as part of this project uh building an app for databricks so i know we've probably told everyone this is about snowflake but just to let everyone know that there will be a, a Databricks equivalent in the pipeline at some point in the future. Yeah, I think it's being checked out by click at the moment, isn't it? So yeah, yeah, hopefully not too long. Uh, next steps, uh, yeah, please do get in touch if you'd like to know more about it um, and more about a message generally. Uh, we have a, a blog on this subject as well, which is coming out later today. Um, we also uh, have a whole host of previous webinars that are on our YouTube channel, so you know, please do follow us on there. Um, and again, I say this each time, let us know if you've got any other topics you'd like us to cover. We're always looking for things that are of interest for you. And um, if I could ask you to do anything out the back of this, it's follow us on LinkedIn because that's where we put all of our announcements. So it enables you to keep up to date with what we're doing. But uh, yeah, thank you to Ryan and David for, uh, for today's presentation. Really interesting. And thank you to all of you for attending. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Cheers.